Okay. Good evening to all of you in Israel and good afternoon or noon to New Yorkers and good morning to the West Coasters. Thank you all for joining us. We're very excited to have this program here today. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Sigal Yaniv Feller. I'm director, executive director of JFN Israel and a lifelong environmentalist. Um, I also lead the forum, the Green Funders Forum, together with Marla and with Sherry Fox and with Gil's loyal assistance along the way. It's uh, J JFN's larger, largest peer interest group focusing on the environment. And in the past year or so, we've been focusing largely on climate change um, and uh, have held this series. This is the fourth session of a five session series. Um, just a quick reminder, the first session was really about framing the issue of climate change, both locally and globally. The second one, we zoomed into intersections between climate change and other fields of giving and gave several examples. Our last session, the third session, focused on game-changing strategies on the nonprofit level, on the third sector level. And today we run a, want to zoom into what our role as a philanthropic community, as philanthropists, as foundations is um, around climate change, what examples we can look from and learn from, what case studies and uh, really get inspired and each of us individually figure out the right way for us to, to move and take action in the field. We're gonna um, spotlight a possible roadmap for the entire philanthropic community to impact climate change and also share, share some lessons from fellow funders. Uh, as I think I've said on every one of the sessions we've had until today, I believe that climate change and the climate crisis is the largest threat that we're facing as humanity, and I believe that the philanthropic community cannot sign, stand by the side of this big threat, and we need to constantly think hard and figure out individually and collectively what we can do and how we can do to make this better. We have about a decade or so to try to shift the course and to create better adaptation to the situation. And I think we're, we're getting encouraging feeling by the numbers of the attendees of the series. And we've seen many, many people join us who are not necessarily environmental funders that have been joining the sessions and reaching out to us afterwards and asking for consultation sessions, which is something that we offer to all of you if you'd like to try to figure out your grant making strategy around climate change. Um, and we offer a session with Gil and myself with no additional charge to really help you embark on your journey. And our vision and mission really is to create effective and um, strategic philanthropy to tackle this field of climate change. As I said, um, the Green Funders Forum is the largest peer interest group that we have in JFN. And its idea really is to provide knowledge and tools to help funders strategically address pressing environmental issues in a non-solicitation space. So we wanna remind you throughout the session today to write your questions in the chat. We're gonna have several speakers today. And after each speaker, we'll reach out into the chat and collect the, the questions for you. So just feel free to note them as you go along. And you can also feel free to reach out to us after the session is over if you need additional information. Gil will also put in the chat the links to the previous three sessions. They've all been recorded and edited so you can follow up and watch them if you haven't seen them before. And, um, and we'll be, we're also um, recording the session today and we'll be able to share it afterwards. So I'm handing it over to Marla, my partner over these years on the Green Funders Forum. Thank you, Marla, and uh, handing it over to you. Thanks, Seagal. And again, we're all well, uh, giving you a big congratulations for stepping up to be the director of JFN Israel. And it is just, again, such a pleasure as always to work with both you and Gil and a lot of other partners along the way. We mentioned Sherry, uh, of course, our lifelong our partner. Um, it, it's so important, I think, to work with, with uh, groups of people. For me, that's one of my personal strategies is to try to increase the circle and to increase uh, and to work in coalitions and in groups, because for me, it's very inspiring. And when we're talking about climate change, which is undoubtedly a very wicked problem, to use the jargon of the times, I think more than ever, we really need to be thinking about these things as a group. So again, it's great to work with uh, you guys specifically and to see so many great people here on this call. Um, I think Sigal pretty much said everything, but just to emphasize that the Green Funders Forum, we strive to be the address uh, 
to be the resource for you wherever you are in your philanthropic journey regarding the environment. So I presume most of you on this call don't currently give philanthropically to the environment, which is totally fine. Uh, we're interested in you coming here to learn and to get involved from whatever way you can. First step learning, perhaps you'd like to dedicate some grant making or major grant re making resources or your investments, or again, just to fit it in where you can. And that's what we're really going to be talking today as part of this roadmap that Seagal mentioned. Um, I'll just say that we are going to have three speakers today and each speaker will be followed by questions and answers. So please note your Q and A in the, or your questions in the chat. And also our very last session of this five part series will be February 14th. And uh, we'll also put the link to register for that in the, in the chat and um, do register or either now or later, because if you don't, undoubtedly I will be sending you at least one, if not two personal emails. So you'll save me some work. Um, with that, I am honored to present our first speaker, Dr. Catherine Dombrowski is the project leader of the International Philanthropy Commitment on Climate Change. This is an initiative through her work at WINGS. WINGS is the worldwide initiative for grant maker support. And it's also part of the Philanthropy Coalition for Climate in Europe. And she'll be explaining more about what that is, of course. Prior to this, Catherine was a social impact advisor and impact investing expert for a social sector consultancy firm and also spent several years at a large private foundation. Catherine holds a master's degree from Cambridge University and a PhD in international relations from the London School of Economics. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you so much, Mahler, and uh, thank you to the Green Funders Forum and the Forum of Foundation for the <clears throat> invitation today. I'm really delighted to be here, and I would like to congratulate you, first of all, on the amazing work um, you are doing and, and bringing so many people together on this topic. It's amazing to uh, have this um, sort of turnout, I think, also at this, this hour of the, of the day. So congratulations. This is fantastic. Um, I will share my screen to give my presentation. Um, hold on, I'll do this now. So here we go. So yes, um, I'm here today uh, to tell you about the International Philanthropy Commitment on Climate Change, which is hosted by WINGS, and the Global Philanthropy for Climate Movement. But before I do so, let me just give you a little bit of background on WINGS. WINGS is a global network of philanthropy development and support organizations committed to unlocking philanthropy's potential. We have almost 200 members across 58 countries. WINGS is usually cause agnostic in the sense that our mission is to increase the effectiveness and impact of philanthropy as a catalyst for social progress. We are, you could say we are field orientated, not cause orientated. But at the start of last year, WINGS decided to start acting on climate together with our members, because we can see that climate is not a specific issue, only relevant to those whose mission it is to protect the environment. We think it has become a field issue for philanthropy, an overarching risk that jeopardizes philanthropy's ability to create impact and to serve philanthropic missions in all fields of activity. And if you are here today, you have perhaps already come to that same conclusion that whatever the issue is you're focusing on, the climate emergency will undoubtedly have an impact on your work in the years to come if you are not already experiencing that impact today. So my presentation today will consist of three parts. I will tell you a little about the international philanthropy for um, international philanthropy commitment and the philanthropy for climate movement, give you some background. I will explain how you can become part of this movement, how you can join the movement. And I will look ahead a little bit at what we have planned this year and how we are going to work with foundation networks and philanthropy support organizations, such as Green Funders Forum and the Forum of Foundations to support foundations in learning and acting in line with the pillars of the commitment. So what is the Philanthropy for Climate Movement? Just a brief historical, if you want, uh, glimpse. Um, it's a global movement of foundations committed to taking urgent action on climate change. 
It consists of a number of national commitments in a range of countries and of the international commitment, which is hosted by WINGS. And worldwide, over 430 foundations have already committed to act in, on climate by signing one of these pledges. The movement started in the UK in 2019 and was then actively promoted by the Philanthropy Coalition for Climate in Europe um, in the years uh, to come. And in early 2021, WINGS decided to develop and host the international commitment. A very active supporter and funder of the movement from the start uh, is and was and is the David and Nina Carasso Foundation. The international commitment, um, sort of how it, different, how, it, how it can be differentiated from the national commitment, the international commitment is open for signature by foundations that do not have, um, that are from countries that don't have a national commitment or that are very international in the scope of their work. The text of the international commitment was developed in a highly participatory drafting process by a global WINGS climate task force, which consisted of representatives from over 40 organizations, um, these being foundation networks and philanthropy support organizations from 21 countries, um, representing around 22,000 funders worldwide. And at this point, I would also like to, to thank uh, Tali Yarif Mashal from uh, the Forum of Foundations, who actively uh, contributed and participated in that process. But now let's uh, look more specifically at the approach taken by the Philanthropy for Climate Movement and the international commitment. So our vision is to build a global philanthropy for climate movement to unlock philanthropy's assets to tackle the climate emergency. We all know that the next year, next, next eight years, I mean, we keep saying 10, but actually it's probably seven this year. The ne next eight, seven years are critical if we want to keep the 1.5 degrees target within reach. Yet currently only 2% of philanthropic funding goes into climate mitigation. And this is the number from the recent Climate Works State of um, Climate Philanthropy report. And over 90% of foundations currently do not work on climate or even climate adjacent issues. So this is where the international philanthropy commitment comes in. The international philanthropy commitment is a call to all foundations, regardless of mission status or geographic location to come together and signal their commitment to climate action. And because this point is so important and because it's really the, the USP, the unique selling point you want or what differentiates this approach from other climate philanthropy approaches in the field, I would like to emphasize it again. So from a foundation perspective, there are really two questions at the core of the commitment. One, how does the climate emergency intersect with my current areas of work? So finding these points of intersection. And secondly, what are the levers for change available to my foundation? And this thinking is actually reflected in the multi-pillar approach um, pursued by the commitment. And the idea that even if your foundation is not a climate fund or even an environmental fund, there are instruments for change at your disposal. So let me talk you quickly through these seven pillars of the commitment. And um, please feel free to also have a look at our website, um, www.philanthropyforclimate.org, where you can find the full text of the commitment with a little more detail on each of these pillars and also a preamble that kind of situates the commitment in the broader climate, global climate justice um, and climate equity discourse. So the first pillar is education and learning. This um, really involves a commitment to work towards informing your boards, investment committees, staff, volunteers, and stakeholders about the systemic causes, impacts, and solutions um, of climate change and the implications for your work. The second pillar relates to the commitment of resources. So making available additional funding for climate-related projects and activities so that as a sector collectively, we can go you know, beyond and above those 2% I just mentioned, but also finding other ways to contribute and also mobilizing non-financial resources 
knowledge resources, human resources, etc. The third pillar is the integration of a climate lens across the programs of your foundation. Um, so I think this is really kind of this, this really requires a shift in mindset. It's about thinking of climate as a cross-cutting issue rather than a distinct program area. And it's finding those points of intersection that I already referred to earlier. So if you are a health foundation, the question is how will climate affect you know, my work in, in the years to come? And how can I take climate considerations into, into the, the planning and the implementation of my programs? The fourth pillar is the um, endowment and assets pillar. So now we're moving from the funding side to the investment side of the foundations. And it's again, taking climate considerations into account in the investment of your endowment and financial assets. I think if you look at the philanthropic sector, this is really huge and, and largely still, you know, largely still untapped potential. If you, if you look at the sector as a whole, there are more than 1.5 trillion dollar assets that are held by philanthropic entities, by foundations in the form of endowments. So there's really a lot of, this is a big cleaver if we are able to you know, activate it. Um, fifth is operations. Operations is relatively straightforward. I mean, there's a lot of talk already now about corporations moving towards net zero, about scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, you know, it's mainly the sort of scope two and three emissions that are applicable to foundations, but it's really about reducing the carbon footprint of your organizations relating to travel, home, you know, the, the buildings you use, etc. And the sixth point is influence and advocacy. This is a point that's included at the international level that was not included in the national commitments. And it's about using the power of voice and the normative influence of foundations and philanthropy to demand more ambitious climate action by other stakeholders, by governments, business, finance, but also to elevate the voices of frontline communities and you know, affected communities. And the final pillar is the transparency pillar. It's really about sharing experiences with others in the field to inspire action by your peers. So uh, now the next part, I said, how, how can you become part of this? Actually joining the movement, signing the commitment is relatively straightforward. Um, you can, the commitment is open for signature by foundations and philanthropic organizations. It's currently not open for signature by individual philanthropists. And you can sign the commitment by coming to our web website, filling in a relatively short application form. It will take you about 10 to 15 minutes. We will review the application mainly to check the foundation status. And we will then improve uh, the application, which means that your organization can be listed as a signatory on our website. However, this is not the end of the journey. In fact, it's only the beginning. So signing the commitment is only the first step towards climate action. So once you have um, committed, you know, we have WINGS and, and all of our partners at the Philanthropy for Climate Movement are working hard to build a community to support foundation signatories on this journey to climate action. And we are doing so um, by working with so-called climate champions. So organizations such as the Forum of Foundations and the Green Funders Forum but also other foundation networks and philanthropy support organizations around the whole world, really from all continents, to provide knowledge resources, tools, and opportunities for peer learning that are necessary to create real change. We will also um, shortly publish an implementation guide for foundation signatories, outlining some of the actions you can take under each of these pillars. And we are planning to host a webinar series this year with one session um, devoted to each pillar. So until all of this is uh, publicly available, I'm happy to direct you to um, some resources that might be helpful in getting you started. This is of course uh, you know, our website where you will find a complete list of all 430 signatories and links to the associated national climate philanthropy commitments, as well as the whole range of FAQs about the, the commitment. And um, it's also uh, the resource section by active philanthropy, especially active philanthropy's climate mitigation tool. And I will say a few more words on this in a second. 
There is one implementation guide that was already produced by one of the uh, national commitments. So the Canadians already have a fantastic implementation guide that I can also recommend to you and um, a very um, helpful um, guide by FSG on how philanthropy must address uh, the climate crisis. And um, yeah, just a, just a few words on active philanthropy. Active philanthropy is a, a think tank and consultancy focused on promoting climate philanthropy and supporting funders entering the, the climate space. And they are one of our knowledge partners for the international commitment. And they have a range of really useful resources in the pipeline for this year, um, such as this climate mitigation tool, which is an interactive tool to help you map the impact of particular, the climate mitigation impact of particular um, actions available to climate funders or to, to philanthropists entering the climate space. Um, they are also um, developing a micro learning course on climate philanthropy, which is scheduled to uh, kick off in April, and you will be able to register for it um, starting next month, and um, a learning center and co-funding hub, which will also be up on, on which they'll also share, share uh, later this year. So I would say, you know, watch the space. There are some, some good resources coming up. This uh, leaves me at this point to um, thank you. And of course, um, I'm really happy to answer any questions that you might have. And um, also, please um, invite you to reach out to me if you would like to find out more or have questions about the commitment or are considering joining and signing one of the commitments. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fascinating and very impressive, the work that you're doing. So first of all, I want to reach out to everyone. And if you have questions to Catherine, please feel free to note them in the chat. We'll read them out to her. Um, we already have a couple of questions lined up. But before that, I just want to mention that even to the members that are on the call night today and are not organized foundations or philanthropic entities, like you mentioned, who can sign the agreement, um, there are many resources and a very good roadmap that everyone can follow. So even if you're not a, an organized uh, foundation yet, but you'd like to get the guidelines of how to do so, there are a lot of resources, even without signing the agreement. So I want to encourage you all to go in there if you'd like to learn more. So one question that we already have um, to you is, what is the expected impact from the philanthropic community and what would you consider a success? I mean, we have sort of, uh, I guess, if you're, if you're an impact, uh, if you, you've worked in impact before, you know, it's always it's hard to track impact in, in the long term. Of course, you know, we want a lot of foundations around the world to take action. So, you know, at an aggregate level, of course, we want to mobilize more resources. We want to have more philanthropic assets um, aligned in line with um, climate considerations. Our intermediary, I mean, intermediary and in more immediate um, term, we really want to get more signatories and we want to build this community of support this is really you know in in the pipeline for this year um and this is is where i'm i'm going to be focusing our efforts um this year um yes i think if you know the vision really the bigger vision what do we consider a success is really mainstreaming climate action in the philanthropic sector it's what i said earlier it's not a you know an issue for climate funders it's something that concerns and affects us all absolutely um at the moment, the the foundations that have joined and signed, are they from all over the world? So the 430 foundations that I mentioned, they include both the signatories to the national commitments as well as to the international commitments. Um, so there is an emphasis on those countries that have national commitments already. There are quite a lot of signatories from Spain, France, um, UK and Italy. So we do have a slight European to, yeah, center and focus right now. But um, this is something we are really hoping to change. I mean, at the international level, we really have signatories from around the world. We have signatories from all continents, um, but um, we, we still have some, some way to go. And we really want to also reach, you know, a lot of, um, get a lot more international, uh, develop more international traction over the, um, this year. And from Israel, you only have the Bracha Foundation or... Do you have other members from Israel signed? I think right now we only have Baracha, yeah. So I hope more after this event. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm well on my way to getting signed up. You're on your way, okay. And Tali will um, will share later also about the journey. We have another question here in the chat. There was a question about uh, courses. 
and virtual courses, websites, materials. So we have, a, there is a special slide in Catherine's presentation that we'll share, but Catherine, if you wanna recommend like something relevant, especially an online course or, you know, something relevant for funders, go ahead and recommend. Yes, I mean, it's really, like I said, the resources I, I mentioned earlier, briefly, especially when it comes to learning, and there's a micro learning um, course that um, Active Philanthropy is developing right now, and um, I actually checked with them today, it will be launched um, in April, so this will be, be available soon, and it's targeted at foundations entering the climate space, and it's, um, it has sort of interactive peer-to-peer -peer, um, components, as well as a more self-guided um, self um, learning, learning journey. Um, yeah, that's that's the one I can recommend. I mean, we will definitely be developing more this year and we will be um, hosting webinars where we are inviting experts and foundations to share their experiences. We will, of course, be recording these and we will also be documenting um, good practices this year. So um, we at the, at the um, level of the um, international commitment will, will hopefully have more resources um, to share at the end of this year as well. We have another question here in the chat. How is the international accumulation of foundations used to apply pressure at the level of Glasgow gathering, for example? Yeah, um, well, I mean, there were a lot of uh, foundations um, present. I would say, they, I mean, the, you know, they, they, there were a number of pledges as well that were announced by, by a large foundations around um, Glasgow and foundations supporting also international pledges, such as the methane pledge, um, et cetera. With uh, respect to our commitment, um, I have to say that this is not so much at this point our focus, because as I already mentioned, we are really trying to get to the you know, 90% that are currently not climate funders. So the ones that are already, that are represented at Glasgow, that are, you know, kind of mingling with the governmental representatives, they tend to be the very experienced um, climate funders already in our target group. And we have some of these as our signatories. And I think they'll hopefully be able to share some of their experiences. So they are already willing to, to share a lot of their learnings and experiences. But our target group are really the foundations new to this climate journey, and they are the ones that we want to work with and that we want to, to support in starting to think about and learn about and act in line with the commitment. Okay, we have another question here from Josh. Are there resources that help people connect the dots between their current philanthropy and climate change? The connection between preserving democracy and climate change, for example. Yeah, um, there, I know that this, this idea, the intersection, intersectional approach is something that um, the Philanthropy for Coalition for Climate in Europe is um, very much um, promoting in collaboration with a range of partners. And they have set up a number of so-called intersectional peer groups, which really brings together foundations, for instance, working on the health sector and, you know, like getting foundations in working on health to explore how climate um, affects their work and what they can do in the field of climate. And they're also addressing a range of other issue areas. I, as far as I know, there's currently not an intersectional peer group on democracy on climate change, even so, of course, this is a really important issue, but these are exactly the sort of intersections that we are hoping to explore and investigate together with our partners in, in this year and in, 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 in the years to come. And another question, if we may, um, are these not the opportunities to use the joint power of the 430 foundations to push agenda? So to push the climate agenda, I'm not quite sure I understand the question, whether it refers to the um, climate agenda within the philanthropic sector or externally. International gatherings. Yes, I mean, you know, yes, of course, as we, um, we, we had a big event at, uh, we had a virtual event at Glasgow this year, we actually used that to launch the international commitment, we brought together policymakers as well as foundation representatives, it was really um, well attended, and I think it was more like the other way around, so it's actually that we used uh, COP to really develop you know, build the momentum within the, the philanthropic sector at this point. And of course, we are planning to do this even more next year. I mean, it's um, this year for all sorts of reasons, we, we decided to, to go for a um, virtual <laughs> format, um, obviously being a very international initiative and also working with partners around the world. It was really hard for a lot of people from a lot of countries to actually travel to Glasgow. So there were some issues of, you know, um, access as well. 
but um, hopefully this year with the upcoming COP, we will actually we might be able to do an in-person event as well, which can of course you know is really designed to also raise the the voice and um, elevate the voice and raise the profile of philanthropy's role um, in tackling the climate emergency. Okay, thank you so much, Catherine, for joining us tonight and sharing the work and. Good luck with the with the next steps. We hope you reach the ninety percent, and as quick as possible. We all, for the sake of us all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'd like to move on to the next part of our program tonight. In the next part of our conversation, we will share some lessons from foundations who take action according to the Wings Commitment Roadmap. Whether integrating climate change into other focus areas, managing investments and endowments with climate change lens, or taking action on advocacy and commitment to resource allocations. We believe that all funders have a role to play and have different entry points to climate change. I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker. Her name has been mentioned already several times tonight, Tali Ariv Mashal. Tali is both the director of the Bracha Foundation and the chair of the Forum of Foundations in Israel and a long life colleague of mine, I think Tali for the last 20 years or so. Oh my gosh, that's scary. Right? Okay. <laughs> uh, her bio is very long and diverse, so I won't go through all of it, but I'll just touch some points. Generally, that she's a lecturer at the Hebrew University. She has a, an extensive background in democratic education and human rights in Israel and abroad, and has always promoted values of social responsibility, education, coexistence, inclusion, and equality. Um, Tali is very uh, deep expert in the field of education, teacher training programs, uh, principal programs, and graduate programs that promote civil education. Um, and um, Tali, we'd like to hand it over to you to share your philanthropic experience and lessons that you've learned on your journey, not only as an environmental funder, as Bracha has been funding environment for over at least the past two and a half decades in Israel, but also from what you've done in the past years of integrating climate change in other focus areas and impacting through coalitions. And of course, in relation to Catherine and her presentation about your experience with WINGS. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sigal, and I'm very, very happy to be here. And um, like Catherine, I'm very impressed by uh, the amount of people that I'm speaking to right now. Don't think I had a chance to speak in front of 80 people before, so this is a first. Um, I will say that I think my presentation, what I'd like, what I'd like to share is, um, is my journey from uh, being a funder or managing a, a philanthropic foundation that funds environment as such to learning and um, widening our scope into the issue of climate, which is which was not um, you know, a very uh, um, straightforward process. I needed, I had to learn. I had to understand how the climate will uh, find itself in our uh, themes of, uh, of activity. And I have to say, first of all, that the, um, the involvement with um, the, the climate action with WINGS helped me very much do that, helped me um, look at what other foundations around the world are doing, help me figure out the theme of climate change and how it can uh, be integrated into our core uh, activities right now. And that's what I'd like to share with you, a little bit about the process that we have been doing and that we are doing. Um, and so somehow the fact that, um, you know, that we have been a, a, a foundation that dealt with, uh, with environment, probably one of the first foundations in Israel that dealt with, in, with environment, which is where the 20 years come from, comes from, Sigar. Um, but that wasn't, wasn't a straightforward access to the issue of climate. Environment is not the only issue that we are dealing with. Yeah, Gil, you can go ahead and share the next slide. So I'll start with presenting the core themes, the, first, the, the current core themes of the Bracha Foundation, what we deal with today. We deal with three core themes, education, environment, and arts and culture. In education, we, we um, look at issues of educational entrepreneurship, basically enhancing the ability of school staffs, of professional teachers and um, school principals, uh, enhancing their abilities to create um, their, to, and, and to bring their autonomy into mm -hmm. their work and um, to be educational entrepreneurs within their schools. We also deal with issues of early childhood professionalism in Israel, um, had a, a very big uh, uh, success lately with the 
uh, move of uh, early childhood into the Ministry of Education in Israel, which was a big thing. That's also one of the things that we are dealing with. In environment, we've been dealing with issues of urban sustainability um, in the past few years, also looking at issues of uh, policy development and public knowledge. And we have been, well, the one thing that I think was uh, special always in our work that is that we were always pretty open about policy development, about our engagement in policy. Um, um, you know, we were, we were out there uh, lobbying basically for uh, various policy uh, developments in Israel um, in, in, in the issues of environment. Um, and in arts and culture, uh, the, the, you know, it's, it's as broad as it sounds, it's really enhancing a multicultural um, uh, network of artists, of creators, of people that are involved and that are ex also, you know, exposed to arts and culture in Israel throughout Israel. And what I'd like to show you now is how um, we've developed, we, we look at the theme of climate in all of our uh, subject matters. So look at, now look at sustainability, climate change is an underlying thing, theme of what we do. And the first thing that I'd like to um, talk about is, is just the, the, you know, the, the general ideas um, that we look at. The first one is that, um, you know, Catherine was talking about the next eight years. We are talking about um, very much the same, but kind of a switch in, in focus. It's the here and now. We're not, it's not about creating solutions for the future. It, it is about our ability to live here. Israel is a hot spot. It's becoming more and more difficult. It's not, it's not something out there. It is our ability to thrive here. It is our, the, the ability of our children, the next generation to, to, be, to, to stay here, to be here, to live here and to thrive here. And so we are working with what we have here and now and not with some, you know, with a broad sense of what we might have in the future. And that's something that's important um, to say and you'll see how it finds its place into our activities too. The second theme is the, is the theme of, of our holistic outlook. Um, Marla said, um, you know, ta talked about the wicked problem. Um, I look at it from maybe a more, uh, uh, I know, a softer way to look at it, but, uh, but it's basically the climate change is, is change of civilization. It's a, it's, a, it's a change of the way we are all going to live. Um, and in such, it touches everything. And so you cannot look at change of civilization through one lens. There's, there's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a multi-layered lens. And in such, my way, very much like Marla said before, um, the way that I think is, is the correct way to look at it is through various um, uh, groups that deal with the issue. So it can be various um, coalitions. Um, you know, just today I sat for an hour and a half with a coalition of educators that deal with climate change. I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, we are funding the climate change um, um, coalition um, at Chaim Vesviva, at Life and Environment here in Israel. So, and, and within that coalition, there are very various groups and various um, themes that work together. And so the issue of climate is not an issue with, that you can look through one lens to figure it out. It's an issue of, um, that is really holistic and needs to be looked at as such and dealt with as such. And then the third thing, which um, you know, we also touched on um, with, uh, um, with, with, in Catherine's uh, presentation is that we cannot talk about the change. We have to be the change. There's no time. There's no way we can talk about, you know, I was talking to someone um, to actually to the to the uh, coalition of um, um, educators for climate change this morning and they were talking about the next generation and you know what we have to educate them for. And, and I said, let's just stop talking about the next generation. It's us. We have to be the change. We cannot move it on. We cannot pass that, um, you know, that responsibility to the next generation. We have to do what we have to do. We messed it up. We might as well take responsibility right now and not talk about what the next generations will have to do. Again, we can go on. And so what I'll show you now is that I'll show you how this uh, finds its way into our, our work. 
um, just through various um, um, examples. And maybe, you know, if you ask questions, I'll, I'll go deeper into these examples. But um, in environment, so first of all, we enlarged or we widened our scope. So we're not looking at environment, we're looking at sustainability and sustainable um, development. And we're doing it through three um, um, ways of, of, of acting. First is that we create, we support, we enhance coalitions, uh, various coalitions that deal with various issues of sustainability. It can be water, it can be education, it can be air, um, it can be culture, arts and culture. There's so many things that, um, uh, so many ways to look at um, uh, the, the, you know, the current crisis or the crisis that we are at right now. And so that is one way of our, of our support. We support coalitions. We help them create uh, their, their act, uh, basically. The second thing is that we believe, as we believed um, since the beginning of, uh, of the work of the Bracha Foundation, much before I came in policy, there needs to be there. We have, we have a long journey here in Israel um, to, to uh, create the policy needed for environmental change. Um, and our, in our focus of practice, we look at urban sustainability with the theme of, you know, basically 90% of people in Israel live in the cities. We have to create our, or enhance our ability um, um, to thrive within, uh, mm. within those cities. And we look at various ways to do that. Um, Gil, you can move on. As you, you said, I have five minutes, let's run through it. Um, the, the next theme that I'd look that I'd like to look at is education, and this is something, um, as Sigal said, that I'm deeply involved in um, emotionally too. And the one thing that I um, that I keep saying is that it is not about you know how we are going to change education for climate change. It is about how do we work with schools in an age in an era of climate change. So it's not about what we're going to teach or what we are, you know, the, the, the new themes that we want to bring into education. It is about working with schools and working with, um, um, you know, the, the various educational organizations in enhancing their ability to work in an era of climate change. And that means not bringing more themes into the, uh, into the system, but, but um, rather focusing themes. So it's not about teaching, more subjects, someone told me this morning, mm -hmm. let's teach, you know, that, that there needs to be a, 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 a curriculum of climate change. There doesn't need to be a curriculum of change, climate change. We need to teach in, uh, in a, an environment that, that brings climate change to life. It is right there. Schools are there. We have to open up the communities. We have to be very focused in our local communities, in our ability to create the change as we teach, at, in, in the ways we, um, we communicate, in the ways we, we communicate with the, with the community around us, in the ways uh, we give the teachers the autonomy to be able to react and to develop the children's and students' skills so that they will be able to live in an era of climate change. That's my main theme. And that's where um, I'm looking at when, I'm, when I look at educational entrepreneurship, that is what I'm, um, that is my, my um, focus area, basically. How can we create an, an, an environment, an educational environment that will enhance the abilities of the next generations to cope with climate change? And the last but not least, uh, theme is arts and culture. And here for me, it, it is really an, uh, um, a, 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 it's the essence of, of uh, being able to look at uh, the issue of climate change. The problem of climate change can and should be analyzed as a cultural problem. It's a cultural um, uh, um, um, theme. It's not, again, as I said, it's not a theme of, it's not a challenge of environment or a challenge of water or a challenge of one issue. It is a challenge of civilization. And as such, it needs to, bring, to, to, be, to be communicated with arts and culture through arts and culture and be part of the way we open up culture, we diverse culture, we uh, make sure that um, there's that, that, that arts and culture is, is, is um, created and exposed 
to each and every uh, community in Israel and, and uh, beyond, of course. So that is, again, a kind of an underlying theme of how do we enhance the ability of people to create, to bring in the, 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 the various voices and to expose them to various audiences. And I'd like to say just um, to end this, um, again, you know, Catherine said that, uh, that, that um, uh, climate change is, is an underlying theme of philanthropy. For me, it's much more than that. I think that you know, we can't talk about public good. We can't begin to talk about philanthropy right now without being climate sensitive, without being responsible. This, it, we must acknowledge the change, we must act on it. For me, I don't see a way of talking today about philanthropy as such we, and, and not connecting it to climate change. This is the world we live in. This is our main social challenge, social, cultural, economic, health. This is where we are. And so we have to act accordingly. That's where I will end my presentation here. Thank, Thank you so much, Tali. So we already have a um, question here in the chat for you. Um, oh, it's more a, a reaction. Okay, two. So thank you, Tali. I love how you've integrated and reframed climate change in each pillar, a great model for all of us. This is from Leanne. And um, Yossi Abramovich, uh, um, we know the source of rising emissions in Israel, which is a strange hold the gas and oil companies have an energy policy in our politicians. So what is the role of advocacy for philanthropy? So again, I said, uh, I, I was very open about it before. We are, you know, we, we support um, advocacy. We support policy change. We support activist um, organizations. And I think that's the, that is our role as philanthropists. We can take the front line. We can also be the ones talking and communicating the message. For me, I've always felt that I'm much less of an expert in these issues than the the the, the organizations are. They're do it. They do it better than us. Um, and it for me, it is that their role. And my role is to make sure that they do it well. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> I want to commend you for your activities. You are active along a number of axes. And um, much of it is uh, long term, uh, which is very necessary, uh, the education, etc. To me, it seems that um, even with your approach, which is different from the one of the former speaker, uh, we don't have the time. Uh, yeah, Israel is a relatively small contributor to the global uh, warming problem, but still, we, I think it's ob um, our obligation to act within our own boundaries. And I think we don't have the time. I think we have to be proactive now. We have to be assertive, I would say, if not more. And the really changes that can uh, occur quickly in a relatively uh, short time are only changes that come through uh, regulation and uh, legislation. And I think that this should be the focus. I would say the, what is needed now is actually two lines of action. One is to prevail on the legislators and the regulators in a very, uh, I would say, assertive way. And number two, to launch a campaign for public uh, knowledge, public education, on, uh, I mean, it has to be a professional one, very, uh, very well focused to bring to the attention of uh, the public uh, um, many of the impacts of global warming, which many people are not interested to hear, but it is time that they must open the ears and the mind and uh, come together to, to act on this. This is my contribution. Yeah, first of all, I agree with everything that you said. And if it, for any um, reason I wasn't clear about our very clear involvement in advocacy, in policy, in um, you know, all, all those issues, that then I will be again. And the second thing regarding 
It's very interesting that you're talking about public knowledge and, um, and access to public knowledge. I've been, I'm, I'm actually diving into it these days and trying to figure out what would be the best way to do it. I've, I've, um, I completely agree. We have to reach everybody. We have to reach everybody very fast. We have to make policy changes. So if, if for any reason, um, I wasn't clear on the fact that we are very much involved in that also, um, let me correct that. I completely agree. And I and if you if you come with me, let's do it together. This is a, an excellent entry point to mention that our last session, the fifth session in our series next month, is exactly going to focus on what can we do together. We're going to have a much more interactive session and break out into smaller groups to think about where we can collaborate, how we take these. I thought we had 10 years, but Catherine narrowed it down to seven. Um, how do we take these seven years and the power in this room and the people we're all connected to and take it to the next level? So this is definitely, I mean, Mickey, Absolutely. make sure that you join us in the next session so we can brainstorm together. Um, there is uh, another remark here for some optimism on the future of our planet and humanity. Um, Gadi put a, a link here on the chat. Um, check out this TED Talk Glasgow from a few months ago so you can all notice and, uh, and copy this. Tali, maybe my last question to you before we move on to our last speaker for tonight is both with your hat as an environmental funder for many years and we've both been around the same community which regretfully is small, especially in Israel, it's extremely small, but also as chair of the Forum of Foundations in Israel. What is the major barrier? Why are we not succeeding? I mean, it is affecting everyone. It's all over the news. It's undeniable any longer. And it still is not, you know, it doesn't catch, yeah. catch up. And I'm not saying make it the majority of what you fund, make it your core issues, but right. give it some, there are so many ways. What, what are we missing? Why aren't we, why isn't it catching the rest? I wish I knew, but I have to say that that's why I'm so involved in this now. You know, Sigal, that for many years, I was kind of very much behind the scenes. I was very careful not to put myself out there, not to, put the, you know, to be behind the organizations, but I um, also the involvement um, with WINGS and, and with the global uh, uh, commitment um, really showed me that we need to act as philanthropists together and we need to bring people to the table and, and figure it out together. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm assuming part of the problem is that people don't know where to start. That's always, you know, it's too big, it's too scary. W you know, what does it have to do with me? My funds are very small. Um, you know, all of those um, answers that we know them, that we know how to deal with them, and we, you know, and we have very clear answers um, to them. I don't think you know anyone really thinks uh, that 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 it is not up to us uh, to change. But I think there's there's fear of you know what what is it that I can do that will actually you know we all we we love of course the discourse that of impact. You know, will I be able to measure, and what will I be able to measure, and you know, and 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 those kinds of uh, questions, and all of these questions have answers. All of you know, we know how to figure out impact. We know how to figure out uh, very clear goals of our of our activities. Um, we just have to start. I agree, and uh, I would say that. As head of JFN Israel, this is something that really keeps me up at night, and we're committed to take a bigger leap into the issue in the coming years and really strategize um, both in the entire JFN community and within JFN Israel and do much more holistic work on climate change across the board with other programming, with our conferences, with greening the work that we do, and trying to create more and more collective or roundtables for funders to come together and collaborate and figure out what they could do better together, stronger, faster, to be able to think together and figure it out. I think the beginning of this process really will take place next week, next month in our next session, but we're involving and inviting all of you to, to be involved and to take a part of this. So Tali, thank you. Thank yeah, you, you, to add some, you wanted to add a last sentence? Did you wanna add anything else? I just wanted to say that I think the collaboration between us, the Forum of Foundations and the JFN is, is another way 
of you know creating that umbrella where you know we can work together on this. I think there's a lot in common between foundations and and um, private donors on issues of climate. It's it's as big for everyone. So this is a first step. Okay, so to be continued. Thank you, Thank you so much, Tali. So we're moving on to our last speaker for tonight. I'm excited to introduce Dr. Gideon Stein. Gideon is an impact investor in Israeli startup companies in the alternative energy, agrotech, and medical spaces. Gideon co-founded Value Square, the responsible investment fund for public equities. He's the former VP in R&D and chief research scientist at Mobileye Vision Technologies and holds a PhD in computer vision from MIT a lab and electrical engineering from the Technion. Gidon and Marla, who you all know, um, founded the or established the Stein Fund seven years ago and since then play an important role in the environmental sphere. Thank you, Gidon, for joining us. All right. Thank you, Sigal. Um, so today I'm going to be discussing two topics, actually. First, how we as investors can help fight the climate crisis. And a totally separate topic, discuss our Marla and my joint advocacy approach to philanthropy. So uh, back in December, I was at a, on a panel at the Globes conference titled, The Climate Crisis is Here. Can the business sector be part of the solution? And the answer is yes. The business sector has been a, for too long a big part of the problem. And now we can and must be part of the solution. And we as investors can make a difference. We own these companies and our companies are polluting and our companies must change. And the US philanthropic foundations together, they manage a total of $1 trillion in investments. And this is a huge amount of money and it must be put to good use. So how do we um, use investments to fight the climate change? This is our personal approach. So I am as a technologist, um, and so we and we know that we need technological solutions to help in the fight. So I do direct investments in technology, in startups such as renewable energy, energy storage, CO2 removal, water, agrotech, and food tech, among others. I also invest in solar fields in Israel and in Africa. Thank you, Yossi. One can add. One can add to the pool of things, rooftop in solar installations, farms, forestry for carbon capture, and I plan to move in that direction. Um, to diversify my deal flow, I, I, I invest in climate tech startup funds as well. Uh, for example, Zora, uh, Vanessa OB, who runs the, uh, the impact invest, the, the JFN impact uh, investment. Okay, and um, but the biggest chunk of our money by far is invested in global public equity, so which is the stock market. And so Marla and I wanted investments to be done in a value aligned and responsible way. And so we started off by working with our trying to work with our bank managers to find products, and they didn't really give us any satisfactory products. So then we teamed up with our friend and neighbor, Noga Leftio Nadan, who's an expert in the subject of responsible investing. And we founded Value Squared, which is a responsible investment fund. And we're also the anchor investors there. And there, Value Squared, they have a team of who do the impact analysis together with, and another team who do the investment analysis. And these teams work together and each one knows exactly what the other one's doing. And the impact team has excellent data to work with, databases and things like that. And they're very up to date on the on the on sort of the modern techniques of doing this. And so even though this is very time consuming, it does mean that we have a very good true values aligned product. And you can measure sort of the you can measure the ESG impact, you can measure the carbon footprint and see they're excellent. So we're actually very happy with that. And they're very transparent. So they'll be happy to explain to you what they're doing. I'm also starting to explore a theme-based public equity investment. That means ETFs which are focused on a particular theme, such as renewable energy, water, agriculture, or carbon capture. So before, I'd like to just define some terms I've been using and will be using. So we have the term negative screening. 
that means uh, we just simply avoid certain areas such as fossil, we want fossil free funds or tobacco free. And then you have something called ESG, which stands for Environment, Social and Governance. So we measure and rate the company with respect to carbon footprint, pollution, workers' rights, community, board diversity, and business contacts, such as bribery. And then you have a term called SGS, which is the Sustainable Goods and Services, where we ask, do the products and services of the company promote a better world? Are they actually going to give a good impact or are they just benign? And these topics could be, they could be companies involved in renewable energy, nutritious food, good education, healthcare. And since these are large companies, they don't all just have one product. The question is, what percentage of their goods and services, of their revenue comes from these sustainable goods and services? So we're not, we weren't always so, this, so focused. And also we didn't have that much money. But our journey really started with a mobile I, I, IPO in 2014, which allowed us, the proceeds allowed us to think about philanthropy in a serious way. And so we decided to give 5% to environment and climate change and liberal democracy. And why environment and climate? Because as Marlis pointed out, environment and climate is everything really. But most of the money we put in the stock market. The S things like the S&P 500, the Russell 2000, the MSCI world, and things like that. Not really thinking where this money was really invested. But if you invest blindly in the S&P 500, you find that 10% of the S&P 500 are companies involved with fossil fuels. 33% of the companies are not that good. They do other things environmentally or don't treat their workers well. And only about half the S&P 500 are companies you'd want to be involved with. So given that we're investing, we're giving 5% as grants, but investing 10% of our money in fossil fuels, it's no wonder that the environmental organizations feel outgunned. We're actually arming our enemy. So instead, what we would like to do is invest all our money in the S&P, in the companies which are which are the good and value aligned. For example, they don't have fossil fuels, high in the ESG, significant re revenue for, from sustainable goods and services, and have a positive climate impact. Now, I think we'd all agree that this looks a lot more sensible. And we're not unique here. Value aligned investing is a large and growing trend. So if you look at the numbers, 17.1, trillion dollars in the US, or is a third of all the US investments are invested with some thought of ESG. I'm a little bit vague here because not as everyone is 100, you know, ESG can be measured in different ways, but we have to go back to that. And over $6 trillion is invested related to climate change. Worldwide, their $40 trillion are being divested or have divested from fossil fuels. True, it's not all fossil fuels and maybe not completely divested, but it's an excellent trend. And universities and endowments, university endowments, which are, are they the ones leading the trend? And that's not surprising because the young students really care. On the other hand, philanthropic foundations are sadly lagging behind at about 9%. So of that $1 trillion, only 90 billion are focused on have any sort of ESG consideration in their investment. So the question you might ask yourself as foundations is how is your foundation doing? And are you thinking about value the line fund investing? Now, another thing you're probably thinking about as a foundation is what's called fiduciary responsibility. Now, fiduciary responsibility actually is two parts. Most people think of, it means make money for the foundation, and minimize financial risk. But fiduciary responsibility also means to know what your investments are and make sure that they are aligned with the mission of the foundation. So think, is your foundation's investment strategy aligned to fight the climate crisis? The climate crisis affects every mission. So it must affect the mission of your foundation. 
It affects social gaps, youth at risk, refugees, hunger, healthcare, even, even science, technology. So literally, it relates to everything. And this means you can get good financial returns. So how do we recommend you start with this journey and how did we start? First, you have to do the research. You learn about what value aligned investing is. So I'm glad you're here. Maybe you can take a course at some peer organizations. I'll list them down below. You can add, then you have to start asking questions, make demands of your bank managers, find out what's in your portfolio, which parts of your portfolio are the worst offenders, what products can your bank offer? Decide on a block of assets, which you want to move across first. See which are the worst and pick a new value that value aligned asset and then act. So really don't wait till you have 100% worked out. You can work in chunks and just repeat the process. So basically we have to, we can start small, but we must aim big. It doesn't help if we only value align 5% of our, of our money. We have to be all in to make a difference. But even though we're thinking 100%, you should be, you might be more comfortable with doing 5%, 10% at a time. So you can take small steps, but let's try to, we have to get this done. And it doesn't have to be climate perfect. I mean, you don't have to have the best possible uh, climate approach and you can do it better next time. You do the first 10%, you learn for the next one. And finally, do talk to your peers. There's a whole community out there. Um, there's an organization called Tonic. That's written there with two eyes, correct? That's the way it's written. There's the JFN Impact Roundtable, which I gather is actually having a session this Thursday, which you should listen in on. And they'll be hosting a member, the founder of Tonic. So that's an excellent combination. And there's even an organization called the United States Sustainable Investment Foundation, which is a has a lot, a lot of information. But you must be aware of fake ESG. So guess who we found inside the S&P 500 ESG index? Okay, all the major oil companies, Chevron, Exxon, Texaco, and even ConocoPhillips. So your basic rule must be, if it ain't fossil free, it ain't ESG. But there is more to ESG than that, okay? So make sure your investment advisor understands and knows what's in the products. You have to educate yourself and ask questions. We did a lot of that. And you decide if it's good, in, you are the one who must decide if it's good enough and if it matches your values and your foundation's mission. And remember, every business has a climate footprint. So screening out fossil fuel companies is quite straightforward. And I've been working with the uh, committee to define the Tel Aviv 125 fossil free index. So now there are products based on that index if you want to invest in Israeli companies on the stock exchange. Um, but for example, did you know that there, did you know that two leading companies making breakfast cereals differ in by 55% in the carbon footprint? Okay, and another thing is, for example, that the European supermarket chains are not buying beef from Brazil to protect Amazon rainforest. Forest. So every every company can have some impact on the climate, uh, have the climate footprint, and can have some impact and try to get better and reduce their footprint. Okay, so that was going to be quite brief. We'll have, I'll answer questions later about this topic but we're moving on to the next one. So we chose advocacy as our philanthropic strategy. Why advocacy? Because advocacy allows you to um, basically um, use the resources of the, of the government and harness those resources for your environmental strategies. So for example, by regulations, by, and environmental friendly laws, tax extensive and tariffs. We know that a lot of the solar energy in this country, solar fields were because the tariffs were good and enhancing. And now of course, solar fields are actually cheaper than gas. 
the government programs which we can help initiate. We want to influence the future budgets and the environmental planning. And very important is to count, we must do counter advocacy and PR against the polluting industries, the fossil fuel and fossil fuel companies. As they say, the largest delegation at Glasgow was from the fossil fuel industry. And we must be able to counter that with advocacy. So how do we work on this? First of all, we, we speak to other people in, in the philanthropic field. We speak to our mentors. Then we went out and did some mapping to see which are the organizations which we would like to support. We don't want to start up a new organization. So we need to do the mapping. We found some excellent organizations, Adam Teva Vadin, which does legal advocacy, Green Course, which is, um, brings together students and uh, for some grassroots organization. Chaim Vesviva is the group, the umbrella group of, our, of green organizations in this country and the well-known SBNI, Society of Protection of Nature of Israel is doing excellent work. So we want to, so we found these organizations and also we had our pet products, pet uh, projects. We wanted to get rid of all those plastic bags, which we find littering the country. So for example, that was a law, which we, which the, some of these, which Adam Teva Vadin managed to pass. The other thing is to listen to the NGOs and find out what is it they think is worth doing. They are actually, understand the topics better than uh, than we do. They have a lot of insight, so it's definitely worth listening to them. And just like with moving our asset portfolio to responsible investing, also here with our philanthropy, the important thing is just start, do something and then correct things later. It is important in advocacy to think long-term. We have to make commitments to these organizations. So you can think of a three-year commitment, at least so that they can plan that they have the funding for what they're trying to do. And there've been quite a lot of successes. As we said, plastic bags law has reduced the plastic bag usage by 80%. So that's 80% fewer plastic bags littering our country and ending up in landfills. The Dead Sea Works is now subject to the Water Authority and is now going to have to pay more for its money, for its water it uses. And the Haifa Bay refineries are to be closed down in the next coming, in the coming five years. So that's going to reduce the pollution in the whole Haifa Bay area. So, um, so what are our insights? First, as we said, go to mentors, speak to other people at JFN, understand what they're doing, and talk to the NGOs and trust what they're doing. Start working and don't hesitate. As we, every, every year you invite you giving out more money, another batch of money so you can correct your path on the way. And work together with other funders so that we give enough so our voice can be heard. Um, okay, so we're here for questions. That was very quick. And so please feel free to contact us later. On philanthropy, Marla's the expert, best to go to her. If you want to talk about investing, I'd be excited to talk to you. And my email is gideon at pashdor.com. And if you're wondering about the Pashdor, it's based on the middle names of our kids, Paz, Shahar, and Dorit, because the kids is really what we're fighting for here. So thank you all, and thank you. So first of all, there's some details really on the JFN impact investing table. Vanessa added information at as did Gil, and uh, and uh, we recommend to all of you that were interested to reach out and uh, and listen to more on Thursday. And um, we have one question for you, Gidon. Um, mm -hmm. In addition to a bunch of compliments that keep coming in in the chat, um, how do you measure your impact? Well. Um, depends, of course, which asset class we're talking about. Um, if it's startups, then a successful startup in the healthcare will save lives. And, you know, if we manage to have something which will improve energy storage or things like that, then I think the impact is quite clear. 
In terms of the public equity, um, there are things we can measure. We can measure the uh, average uh, carbon footprint of the companies in our portfolio. We can show, see if there's a downward trend in those companies. And that means it probably wouldn't be just due to our investments, but that the investment us investors are managing to influence the companies possibly in, the, in this way. Um, we can also see, we can also measure the uh, ESG ratings of the companies which we're in our portfolio and make sure they're all that they're you know better than average. So we want to invest in the better companies. Um, part of it's a little bit like um, basically we want to make sure that we can make sure that the companies we're investing in are companies which we're proud to be associated with. It's not clear that you know the amount of money I personally can invest will, will actually make a huge change to some of those huge multinationals. But as a group, as a you know if. $17 trillion worth of investments are geared towards good ESG companies, low carbon footprints, it'll make companies change. Okay, great. And another question, um, is there a coordination among the NGOs working in the stock exchanges to advocate reduction of investment in fossil using companies, do you know? Is there coordination okay. on the nonprofit level that are working on in the yeah, stock? Yeah, so there is something, uh, I don't know the English of it, Forum Kesef Naki. It's the Clean, Clean Money Forum. Clean Money Thank Forum. You. Yeah. Okay, so for example, there was a great initiative on their part, which was to set up um, something called the Israel Tel Aviv 125 Fossil Free. I'm on the committee to help pick those companies, which should be in there. It's very strict criteria, so I don't really have any, we don't have much judgment here. But that was an initiative by an NGO to make a product on the stock market, on the stock exchange, which now people can invest in. And you know, now we can invest in Tel Aviv 125 without investing in fossil fuels. Um, we would like to go further and have something which was truly value aligned because there are companies there which I wouldn't invest in, but um, but that is a good initiative from the NGOs. And there is a follow up here and in the US, are you aware of parallel things? Um, I don't follow the US, but yeah. I mean, we have these big organizations. I mean, there are definitely NGOs like for example, Tonic, which is pooling together investors, teaching investors, giving them the tools. Um, I think the insight that foundations have the fiduciary responsibility to be value aligned and not just make money, that's an insight I must, uh, from a tonic lecture, which I followed. Mm -hmm. and and also we, actually, we actually had a, an interesting uh, session last time with one of the speakers talking about uh, the global movement of divesting investments and uh, climate finance. So anyone who wishes uh, to watch it again, we'll send it again and mm -hmm. I'll do it now. Yeah. And there are also some links, Josh Arno added some links here in the chat. We'll organize a follow-up email with all the presentations that were shared tonight and the links to the resources mm -hmm. and lectures that you can follow to, to do some additional follow-up reading. Um, Vanessa wanted to add a word. Vanessa, you can unmute yourself and say it quickly, you have like a minute and then we'll start closing. Katie and Amala, thank you so much for the great presentation um, and for really your, your leadership in this space and, and particularly the pioneering in, in Israel has been hugely impactful. Um, Gideon, I was curious how, um, as, as private investors, you recommend that we think about encouraging you know, fossil fuel companies to be investing in renewable technologies and how to balance sort of total divestment um, from shareholder activism and um, you know, uh, I'm thinking about some of these companies, um, whether it's Aramco or Shell or Exxon, you know, investing in startups and new technologies that are, are carbon neutral or sustainable. What's the, what's the right, what's the right role to play with those companies? Um, that's a tough one because if, if my Tel Aviv 125 fossil free committee had, um, basically if a company 
one of the oil companies in Israel decides to put 10% of their money in renewable energy, they're still a fossil company. So they're still, we cannot accept them into the fossil free index, even if they, uh, so, I mean, there's a very strict criteria for that. And specifically Aramco, I saw they had a big ad in the new, they have an ad in, news, in the New York Times every week, at least. And one of them was about how they're developing uh, carbon sequestering in concrete. But if you look at the numbers, you see that if everyone, they took all the concrete in the world was produced in this method, it wouldn't, you, it wouldn't sequester even 10% of the amount of carbon which the oil companies are producing to be burnt every year. So um, one has to be a little quite suspect of these things. Excellent that they're doing, giving us solutions, but it still doesn't give them a clean ticket. And we have another question here from... Thanks for your great presentation. I think the, the question about uh, the big companies changing, I agree, it's like, what's a tipping point? But the idea I've seen about shaking them up and saying they need to divest of all of their assets you know, there's some activist shareholders saying they really need to divest the renewables assets. And the question is, would that then just, if they did, would that reduce the amount of capital that could go into renewables? And is it better from um, trying to push them in the right direction to say, at some point you hit a tipping point. If you're 51% or 52% in renewables, then you get a card of help because the amount of money that a a Shell or a BP or one of those folks can put into renewable energy is massive. And also, if you look at the shift, you know, them doing solar power and a solar gas station, like what can they do to cannibalize their business mm -hmm. of selling truckers electricity instead of gasoline? If we want to push them in that direction, right. otherwise somebody else has to come along and, and pull their market share. Yeah, I agree. I think what we, it's, you know, uh, I think we have to look at what are, they have to be very clear about their long term plans. If you see Shell saying that we're not going to be producing oil in 2030, and this is our business plan to get there, then you could say, okay, you know, we like that. But if they say, you know, we're going to be producing oil and selling oil to 2050, um, then they are an oil company. So I think that's, I think you have to look exactly at what their plans and what their declarations are and what they're going to. Um, but it's a tough one. Um, I think I'm an engineer, um, so I can help with engineering solutions. I think the bankers are going to have to help you with that one. No, I, I don't mean it as a banker question. I just mean it as an, an influencer because right. I'm watching some companies do that. And I, I happen to think if we want to move capital in the right direction, you're saying if their target is zero oil, would that make them put them into this ESG category? Like I agree, there's there's more talent and there's there's more talent and more money in for profits than non profits. It's like as a percentage, you have a right. lot of people in these, and you don't want to you want them moving in that to right direction. So if you say Shell, if your target is zero, does that mean you become part of the this asset class that can invest in ESG, or do you have to just be more than 50%? I think zero is good. But, uh, but if they say, like, I'll never go to zero, then do we suddenly lose what could still be pretty good? Mm -hmm. Well, it's also a question whether they can actually split off. I don't know if they split off another company, which we could then invest directly in their spinoff. That would be a solution to that, right? We, um, they say we spin off renewables as a separate company they own 50 percent of that we can invest in the other 50 percent okay so thank you very much um marla i think you're gonna close since uh, seagull just uh, went off the zoom so it's your turn okay <laughs> i just missed what you said um get, i'm sitting right next to gideon who it turns out that i'm <laughs> related to. Um, so we were having an echo problem. Anyway, thank you again so much for coming. I, who have heard Gideon speak many times, this was the first time that I really heard him say this amazing, very powerful figure that we, uh, if we invest kind of in the regular stock market without really any um, 
intention of it being uh, responsible, then if you then it adds up to say about ten percent of your of your investments are going to be going to that. Like this is a hypothetical situation, but if you're not paying attention to your investments, you are by far going to uh, be working against your philanthropic endeavors, and even if you're giving all of your five percent of philanthropy to climate. So I hope that made sense. But investments are very, very important. And uh, Gideon said that, you know, as kind of small investors, we don't make a difference, but we do as a group, we absolutely do. And they, the companies are starting to really listen. And so we need to make our voices heard and make sure that we're out there and doing it together and not having the excuse that we're too small. We all add up. And Mickey, back to your point in terms of advocacy, that's also where we get the big bang for the buck. And this is our personal strategy that, um, uh, you know, we can clean the beach, but we need to be out there making policy and getting the higher impact. So you heard it here first and uh, watch out for greenwashing and and fake ESG, as Gideon said, you really have to ask the questions. Do not be intimidated. Your investment managers often do not know what it is. So you have to put the questions out there and do not settle. And it's interesting when we ask the questions, oftentimes they'll say, oh, um, I don't know. It's just something our back office suggested, or um, I don't know what are the holdings in that ETF, even though it's ESG, I, I guess I'll have to Google it. So push your financial managers. They need to be doing better for you. We, as Gideon said at the beginning, we own those companies. Okay, at any rate, thank you so much for coming. Um, our last session will be February 14th. And also, um, please feel free to be in touch with any of the speakers today. Uh, as Seagal was kind of implying, it is, it is overwhelming. It's hard to know where to get started. And that brings us back to the Green Funders Forum. More than anything, we'd like to help you, move you to impact. Uh, that's actually part of my own personal impact. I want to move you to impact. So we do give complimentary consultations. There is absolutely no obligation. Just show up. It doesn't mean you have to give more. It doesn't mean that you have to even join JFN. Um, just come and bounce off ideas and we'll, Gil will meet with you and help you decide, figure out where you are in the process and what makes sense for your first steps. So please do take advantage of that. That'll be like my new year's present. Um, and let's see if I, anything else. So February 14th and, oh, the international conference, the end of March. Um, I'm planning to go if uh, travel restrictions allow. And, and we're gonna have a else? session let's about climate change there. We are having a session about climate change and to remind you, this Thursday is a great, JF, a great opportunity. The JFN Impact Investment Roundtable happens to have the director of TONIC, which is that global impact investing network. So it's a great chance to take this further. Uh, thanks very much and good evening to everybody. <laughs>